guys, I'm in Miami at this natural disasters conference, like a trade show thing that I'm about to show you around. And I just wanted to reshoot the intro now that I've been through it because it is, while there is good stuff in there and I'm gonna show you the good stuff that I'm excited about, mostly around prevention of uh, disasters happening. You can't prevent the hazard from starting in the first place, but like you can mitigate it once it's underway. There is a lot of depressing stuff in here. And I have to say, this is the single most upsetting uh, trade show I've ever been to in my life. And I want you guys to see what I see when I go through something like this, because the people who are trying to mitigate disasters are trying to do good things. And of course the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I just had a conversation with a woman who says that she runs a hydroxyl generator on 100% in her bedroom every night because her husband invented the thing and it's fine. And so I was just trying to like warn them, maybe don't run it right next to your faces while you're working on these trade shows all the time. I met a lawyer who is helping to sue all the insurance companies whose job is really to keep all the money you give them and never give it back to you. And he's like specifically detailing all the ways that that's happening. That's coming up in an upcoming episode of the podcast. I'm just gonna do a full interview with him. So stay tuned for that, make sure you're subscribed. And then also a lot of ozone generation, a lot of hydroxyl generation, a lot of like chemistry and building these really insanely horrible um, worker lodgings for the emergency workers that go down there. So uh, I'm gonna take you inside. Let me show you the good stuff to start out with so that we can be like glass half full at the beginning here. A little bit of a like thrown together affair. I'm carrying my equipment around. They don't have any kind of a place where I can leave any of these boxes. Obviously I'm like running my own stuff. Also I'm wearing this throughout this video because last uh, conference I went to, I got COVID. So I'm not messing around anymore. That is an example of engineering at work. Engineering being a series of compromises because you can't have everything. That thing is this dome structure that's meant to like withstand natural disasters and it is quick to uh, put up, it is portable, it is quick to take down, it is, uh, you know, weather resistant, shaped perfectly like a dome would be, uh, it is affordable to manufacture, etc, cetera, etc, cetera. but it's made out of fiberglass that's going to be potentially sealed, like air sealed, so it might be super airtight, so you might have whatever you put in there off-gassing, so now the air quality really suffers. Humidity in there is gonna be kind of a nightmare because that's a, you know, maybe 200 square foot place with a ceiling height average of like maybe six feet. Hardly any air in there at all. So if you do have access to electricity after a natural disaster, you can have the same problem that I had in my hotel room here, which is that it's gonna cool really easily, but it's not gonna dehumidify very well. That being said, the insulation is pretty, they said that the options they've got are like half inch EPS foam, which is R2 which in Florida, it's not gonna fly. You gotta park that thing underneath in the shade, number one. Number two, protect it from hot weather, et cetera. They'd said that they do have better options for insulation, but it's a little bit more intense and makes it less mobile, et cetera. So anyway, I thought that that was like an interesting uh, example of the trade-offs that we all have to deal with because like, yeah, domes are great. And I was just talking with my friend Eric over at Wall of Wind and he was talking about how domes are like the best way to build. And also all doors, all exterior doors should open out because of wind loading. And like, for somebody like me, of course there they're, they're are pros and cons. So I think that like talking about these things with people who are focused on different priorities is very interesting. This is not to do with homes, but it is very interesting. And I wanted to show you guys this. This is called Ocean Therm. This is my friend Olaf from Norway. Um, and they have this idea of using bubble curtains uh, like basically dropping a hose to the bottom of the ocean and then pumping bubbles up through. And I asked how many CFM we're talking about because, you know, I'm obsessed with that kind of stuff. And he said he didn't know, but the compressors and the ships would use 15,000 gallons of diesel per day when they deploy them. Here's the Florida Keys. And all of this is basically very shallow. So what they're trying to do is just drop the temperature of this water going right through here from 90 degrees on the surface to 80 degrees by going down to the cold water underneath it and bubbling that up here. And they're using the fact that there is a velocity of the water that way to basically cool this water. And then that cool water will carry through between the strait between Cuba and Florida. And potentially you could use this anywhere, but I think that the idea of using the flow and the pressure and the temperature, it's the same thing that we're always dealing with in homes. And basically what we do is of course, weather systems inside of homes. 
And this is a really interesting example of how you could use that in the real world and people are using it. And by the way, this would cost to deploy this for, and change the temperature for four days. You're saying it would cost 674 and a half million dollars. And that includes all the costs of the diesel and the ship rental and all that stuff for an entire season. But it would give you $16 returns in the disaster lessening for each dollar you spend. Isn't that crazy? Like the scale that we're thinking of when we talk about natural disasters is just uh, uh, blows my mind. Five second detection of a fire that's six by six feet, one mile away. Um, this thing is not an infrared thermal camera, but uh, go ahead, Ralph. So Ralph is standing all the way over there with a lighter and this thing is detecting that flame. And the way that he's doing it is with optics. So this is basically a light, is a photo sensor. And they're, they're doing a couple of things. The optics are the things, the lenses are the things that are really like helping them first. And then also they've got programming in, in here. So they're filtering out the sun so that they get rid of this very wide bandwidth of, of light. And then over here, they're filtering out people. I don't understand how exactly, like I'm, I'm like just learning about this, but movement of people and animals and heat signatures from them basically. And what they're looking for ultimately down the middle is the photo characteristic of heated CO2, which they can, you can see from so long away because you're able to, they're focusing all of the light from a 16 degree field of view up to a mile away onto just one little tiny sensor. And if any of the wavelengths of light that hit that sensor are that characteristic of heated CO2, which is created by flames, then this thing goes off. You guys know I'm wearing my mask because I've got my nice little face marks. It's a tattoo. I should just get this tattooed on my face. All right, so this is shrink wrap. You can see that that plastic wrap around an entire building, especially at a disaster conference, we might be talking about a place that got flooded. Seems like it might be a problem because we're trying to get plastics out of the wall assemblies. But this is obviously for disasters. That one right there was wrapped around a scaffolding and then they used venting to kind of like contain the workspace. So there's, people are working inside of that thing. That's kind of interesting. This is the more um, effective home application for this would be in place of a tarp. So if your roof blows off or, you know, gets a hole in it after a disaster, instead of a tarp, which is generally always going to deteriorate in the sun, number one, and therefore is going to leak no matter how air watertight it was to begin with. This stuff is gonna shrink wrap and it's got a three year guarantee. Three year guarantee, wow. Um, for UV resistance and uh, like, you should get your roof fixed within a year. I think that that would be a good idea. But anyway, it does shrink up into a little ball if you let it, which uh, you're using this thing to weld the seams to each other. This gun will output 300,000 BTUs when you light it up. Um, that's bigger than any boiler I think I've ever tested in a residential setting. So that's pretty impressive to come out of one little gun. I would not want to be the guy whose job is to like <laughs> run that thing. I'd be worried of setting everything on fire in the whole world. Um, so they, ha they do have, they are concerned about airflow. They have little vents that they're putting on there, which are just passive vents. That's an interesting one. Um, and then also if they're, if you're worried enough about like a wet building trying to dry out, then you got to blow air through it and you got to use fans and things like that, obviously. Um, but also you want to make sure that the temperature is controlled. You can see that all these are white. This one right here, they have a blue version as well. And I was just thinking like, why is it white? Because maybe you want to, you know, induce more of a stack effect that's going to drive temperatures. And then of course, my friend Ryan at the company here was like, oh yeah, but also at night, then when it cools off, weird things start to happen with condensation. And I thought like, oh, that's a good, good, good deal. They do not make clear uh, because that is definitely gonna turn your house, you know, the, whatever it is that you're putting this on top of into a greenhouse and it's gonna make really weird things start to happen with heat and with humidity. There's a lot of stuff here that makes me sad too though. There is uh, a fair amount of chemistry creating air cleaners and the people who are selling them are real excited about them. I said, like, does this thing create hydrogen peroxide and it ionizes and it has a UV light in it? 
And they said, yes, it's amazing, isn't it? It's so incredible. It's gonna clean your air like crazy. You've watched this channel. If you're watching this far into this video, you know, like we're not really excited about that. That's a lot of side effects. When people are desperate, they'll do almost anything. <sighs> one of the, so I'm almost done. And, and one of the other things that makes me sad is thinking about the workforce that's gonna go down and help people who are in disasters. Cause of course, like they're trying, you know, even if they're just doing it for a job, they're showing up in places that are probably messed up, probably not very healthy to be in, trying to help people who are really desperate. So this is one of the options for the uh, living situations for the workers. I believe this is like eight feet by eight feet with an eight foot ceiling. Uh, the air conditioner that is installed there, uh, like my conversation about my hotel room from this, this day, is way oversized. It's 5,000 BTUs per hour, which is basically the same size as my tiny house's uh, air conditioner, which is an inverter driven Mitsubishi, which can go down to 1,300. This one is a single speed installed right there. Um, the ventilation, I was like, how are you getting the ventilation? Because the like, little bunk is built into a like, little nook. And uh, they said, oh, we've cut a hole in the top. And I was like, okay, well, how, well how's the air getting back in to replace it? And they said, why are you asking so many questions? So hopefully I'll hear from their technical uh, director or engineer, and we'll see if they, if they have like proper you know, answers for this stuff. But like, they're gonna have massive humidity problems. This is not a good living situation. Like you're putting people who are going to help people into living situations that are also potentially disaster prone from a building science perspective. So here we are again. So thank you for watching all the way through to here. Even though that was largely depressing, there was some good stuff and people are like doing things. I think that the research backed stuff that people are doing is great. The stuff that people are just trying to sell to people who are desperate and then they've got to buy something. Make sure that you spread the word on this kind of topic. Subscribe if you're not already. Like and, you know, comment below, ask questions, etc. And um, tune in next time.